Ah, commentary on the last hymn. Obviously, we're not singing about charity as in a charity organization. It's another word for God. Sorry, word for love, not for God. A little uh, shortness of breath makes your memory work slow. Uh, but I found you can, you, if you've got the good, even with a good thick cotton mask, you, if you breathe real hard on the inhale, really suck it through the, the cloth, you can actually get enough air to sing. I wouldn't want to sing the, that fast song again. That was, uh, that was a bit much for the uh, pulling in the air, but otherwise it works okay. I'll give you the title of the sermon today uh, that, to start it off that makes it simpler. The Ethic of God's Way. We have charity, now we have an ethic. Not epic, but God's ethic has epic proportions. Just try to confuse you a little bit. The Ethic of God's Way. Now we know what ethics are, you know, it's behavior. You know, what, what do you value the most? Because what you, what you value the most is typically what you do. What you think the most is typically what you say. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we're looking at the ethic of God's way. Now, uh, we know what that ethic is. It's love. God's concern and love. But uh, I think it's important for us to understand this and consider this a great lesson from the ministry of, of Christ. We'll turn to John chapter 5 to begin with. John chapter 5, the ethic of God's way. Here we go. We'll start in verse 1 and uh, actually go through about 15 verses, but we'll pause and commentary on, uh, comment on them as we go. John chapter 5 and verse 1. And here we have, After this there was a great feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. The, the feast of the Jews would, was here, I believe, it was the Feast of Tabernacles. I have to double check that because it doesn't tie it in directly into the text. But you can figure those all out based on other details in the Gospels. But it was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, uh, uh, there was a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethesda, or Bethsaida, probably is how it was pronounced over there, or closer, closer to that. We pronounce it Bethesda. Uh, and we have a lot of cities in America, in various countries or suburbs, called Bethesda. And it's, this is why, actually, if you wanted to go through the names of the cities and counties in America, you would find a phenomenal percentage are Bible names. Phenomenal percentage, which that's important for tracking where the tribes of Israel went to. They carried that knowledge, Old Testament and New Testament. So it's, it's very interesting from that perspective. We, an added level of, uh, or layer of evidence of the identity of the, who the tribes of Israel eventually ended up as. So the sheep gate, and there was a pool. The pool was called Bethsaida, and it had five porches. Now, by five porches, I'm guessing perhaps that means five uh, levels of seating areas where people could come and sit, maybe like benches. Uh, and, and, and based on the rest of the story, that's why I, I'm guessing that. And in these laid a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. What do you mean the moving of a water? Well, this is what happened. It was a miraculous event that God had to, ordered to occur at various times. For an angel went down at certain times, in verse 4, at a certain time, into the pool and stirred up the water. And then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Wouldn't that be something? You know, we, th we thought that miraculous healing only came with anointing or specific personal action of God, but God actually set up for a period of time, and we don't know how much, certainly it, it would appear that it was after the, the Jews had returned to rebuild Jerusalem, 
exactly when this began to occur, it then probably is open to speculation as far as that goes. But in the time of Christ's ministry, it was there. During the time that Christ was alive and, and his ministry was taking place, there was a surge of spiritual interventions in things. Certainly his healings of people were part of that is what we're going to read. Now we go down to verse 5. Now a certain man was there at, at uh, Bethsaida, the, this pool that was next to the sheep gate. Oh, I forgot to explain the sheep gate. The sheep gate is a smaller gate. It's still, there is one now, you know, on the rebuilt walls as the Turks put them up later. Uh, it still is, the entrance is still the same place. The, the gate is still where the gate was, you know, to buy since time immemorial when it was first built. And it is near, uh, near the temple, not as close as you would be if you came in uh, down, downhill from the temple itself, but this is a little ways north of the, of the temple. And it was where the sheep for the daily sacrifices were brought into the city. And I'm presuming that's also where uh, uh, oxen and, and uh, other you know, animals that were used for the, for the sacrifices as pertained, you know, sheep sometimes and, and the goats and what have you. This is, that was where they were brought in. But uh, a sheep was offered once a day at least one, you know, the, as a bird offering at the, at the temple. And the livestock were brought in through the sheep gate. So that gives you a perspective of where it was. It would be, again, in the north uh, east corner, roughly speaking, northeast corner of where the walls have been reconstructed in modern-day Jerusalem. And where, that's roughly where it would have been in, in ancient Jerusalem, based on where the excavations have shown the walls stood at different times, the Roman times, which is this time or before. So this man had been at an infirmity for 38 years, and when Jesus saw him lying there, so he had it for 38 years, uh, it was something, you'll see, it was something that he did that caused it, uh, the infirmity, because it doesn't say any more than just the infirmity. And Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that position a long time. Uh, now, Christ perhaps could know that supernaturally, but more than likely, he had been watching. You know, he faithfully kept the feast days, so he had been there. He probably saw the man lying there. You'll find out why he would continually be lying there. Uh, on one of those poor sitting, if he could sit, on the porch. And the sick man, he said, do you want to be made well, is what Christ asked him. He saw him lying there, he knew he'd been in that condition a long time, and so he said to him in verse 6, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down in before me. So the other person gets healed, and he could never get there quickly enough to actually be one of the ones healed. So Jesus said to him, rise up, take your bed, and walk, which means you're healed. In Christ's usage of those phrases, he used them a number of times. And immediately the man was made well, and he took up his bed, which would be... Uh, a blanket pad of some kind that he would be sleeping on there or resting on, um, uh, on the whatever benches that they had available in the five layers of, of that uh, around the, the, the pool. And he got up and took his bed and he walked, rolled it up and walked away. And here he couldn't walk except very haltingly for some reason, presumably maybe a foot broken, leg broken, who knows what it was, that didn't heal right, and so he was, he was lame all, you know, for you know, a long time, 38 years. And that day was the Sabbath. Now we're following into a new aspect of it. And the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now it doesn't say exactly how far he got, carrying his bed, uh, the, his bed roll, more or less of what it would have been. But he got a little ways, and then he was accosted by the, the, the Jews, some of the Jewish officials, and said, it's unlawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Now, was it unlawful for Christ to heal the person on the Sabbath? No. 
Now we know that because that was an issue that was dealt with several times in uh, the, the four Gospels. It was lawful for him to heal on the Sabbath uh, because God writes the law and Christ knew it. The Jews had developed their own standard, so healing on the Sabbath wasn't allowed. There's another time, I remember, there's a man who had a shriveled hand. It was broken or whatever, but it was all shriveled up and, and useless. And, or in another time, maybe a little leprosy. But whatever the case, he healed the man's hand on the Sabbath. Frankly, he did it as a challenge. I believe that one was up in, uh, near, closer to Nazareth. Did it as a challenge to the authorities. Because their, their rule was not biblical. So he was taking issue with it. And making a very powerful statement. It was not unlawful for the man to, uh, to, for Christ to heal the man on the Sabbath. That was what we're going to be brought up in a minute. But notice how Jesus steps out of the limelight. Uh, then they asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? And the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn and a multitude being in the place. So he, he found he could walk. He picked up his bed like he was told and looks around. Where was that man? He's not there anymore. Christ has stepped out of the way. Then afterward, Christ found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more. Now, humans are going to sin. They're going to try not to if they're faithful, but we will fall short. But this is deliberate sin that you're not trying to overcome. Is what would certainly be the, uh, the context here. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. But notice, Christ stayed out of the limelight. He didn't make a big show of the healing. He didn't do all the shouting and trying to get people to chant with him and do things like that that we sometimes see in the way religion is conducted today. He just quietly admonished the man to live a good life, be obedient, and to be thankful. You know, Jesus Christ was not the, the one that was running around to get attention of everybody. There's a, there's a line out of a poem that I like, poem's title, it slips my mind at the moment, but I know who wrote it, Edgar Guest. Guest like somebody you invite into your house, Edgar Guest. He was a poet back in the 1930s, and he wrote some of the finest things about domestic life in America. Beautiful poetry. But one of my favorite pieces of one of his poems is this. God grant that I may live upon this earth and never lose the glory and the worth of humble service and the simple things. Now Christ performed a humble service. No shouting, no chanting, no wild music uh, for the man's healing. He just humbly healed him. And the man then departed, in verse 15, he departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. <laughs> well, that didn't set well with the Jewish leaders uh, and the parties of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They didn't like what Jesus had done at all. That infuriates them. This healing demonstrated the core ethic of Jesus Christ, however. This is what we're looking at. The ethic of God's way. This demonstrated the core ethic, or standard of behavior, standard of life, standard of thinking. How do we define the core values of God's way ourselves? How do we define the ethics of God's way? That's, that's really a key question. We want to follow the example of our Savior. We are commanded to follow the example of our Savior. But the question of really is, do we have the same ethics as Christ? Now, the ethic, the word ethic is a, is a it's not ethnic, by the way. Ethnic means a, a people of a certain group, uh, typically a certain uh, genetic group. But ethics, E-T-H-I-C, S for the plural, uh, is a set of moral principles, especially ones relating to or affirming a specified group or field or form of conduct. And that's what an ethic is. Sometimes people will say, I would have done such and such, but that wouldn't have been ethical. And if they were correct, then that would bully for them because there aren't very many people that worry about ethics today. 
They do what they want when they want to do it. It's things like this epidemic that we're enduring right now that sober some people up and they start thinking about ethics, which actually, you stop to think about it, maybe God is planning to call more brethren into the church. There's nothing like a great big uh, epidemic that lingers on, as this one has lingered on, and yet it is a short still compared to uh, others in the past. There's nothing like this to sober people up and make them start thinking about the meaning of life. Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? Where are we going from here? To quote Herbert Armstrong in all three questions. He's a, he often said that. You know, the, uh, the Puritan ethic, for instance, was being replaced by the, hed the uh, hedonist ethic. That's a commentary on American history. The Puritan ethic was the ethic of the early Americans who worked hard. Uh, they didn't ever think perfectly by any means, but they worked hard. And they had a way of thinking that defined how this country has come to have the culture it has. Very different from any other country, including different significantly, not entirely different, but significantly different from what we call our mother country at times or used to. That would be England, because that's where the, uh, the culture of America came from. Now, we know something else that others don't know. The, the English culture is from the tribe of Ephraim, and this culture of America is Manasseh, two, two brothers, uh, way back in the patriarchal days. So that's why we have the, the difference that we have. But the early, the early culture of America was based on the Puritan ethic. Now, it was a God-fearing ethic in as much as they understood God. And even among those Puritans, uh, before very long, there were some who were actually true Puritans in a sense, uh, they were Sabbath keepers. They were part of the Church of God, migrating over from England or sometimes from Holland first. Bear in mind, our pilgrims, who uh, were the pilgrims of the, the Thanksgiving, the original Thanksgiving as we typically describe it, uh, actually sailed from the Netherlands to America, not from England to America. See, they first decided they needed to get out, what was, out of what was an increasingly secular to them, increasingly secular English culture. And so they went to Holland where they thought they had safe haven. But then they found that the Dutch culture was going the same direction as the English culture. So then they started looking toward the new world and that's how they sought sail, shall we say, in uh, the uh, the ships that they took over there to eventually the Boston, greater Boston area, and Massachusetts was one of the la main landfalls for the Puritans. And they became some of our primary founding fathers. An awful lot of the great politicians and leaders of America, especially early America, were from that area. The Puritan ethic was being replaced by the hedonist e ethic, is the example they give here of ethics. And uh, what Holland was experiencing was a rise in the hedonist or pleasure seeker ethic. And the Puritans knew that, that some of that they couldn't live with because they tried to take the Bible seriously. And they did to a large extent. And there were, as I said, some, among some of them, there were people who we would look back at now and rec reckon that they were brethren because they were Sabbath keepers and their other doctrines where we can find the detail of their doctrines in their writings. Their other doctrines coincide with what the scriptures say. So that's one of the key ways that we track where the, tr the true church went from, from time. It was started in Palestine, and that's, when I say Palestine, I'm not deriding Israel at all. The Romans called the area Palestine. That was their name. Now Israel has their you know, had the, the Jewish people have their uh, roots in the homeland, the original homeland from where they came and also from where the ten tribes came. So they call it Israel, which is good. But it's in, important to see the, the, the different names that were being used over time. The Puritans then came to America because they wanted to live 
according to what their religion. Some of them, as I said, were Sabbath keepers, and we would reckon them to be true church members. They settled in Rhode Island, primarily. That was the, uh, one of the havens of Sabbath keepers. Other, other of the Puritans were in Massachusetts, not terribly far away, and other places in the Northeast on the coast. The true ethics of God's law, though, are recorded in his word. See, there, the, the Puritan ethic was one thing, and there were, there were many true values in the Puritan ethic, except they kept Sunday, but they kept it like it was a Sabbath. And there were other things that they believed that were close to the doctrines of the Bible. Uh, those who were in the true church understood the true ethics from God's law. I'm reminded of not only migrations to America, but migrations because of religion to other places. And one would be the penal colony. How many know where the penal colony is? No. Oh, okay. Oh, wow, we got the historians rooted out right here. All three, four of us. Uh, the penal colony was Australia. They don't like to advertise that. You know, it's not exotic when you call it the penal colony. But one of the, uh, the wives of one of our pastors down there, uh, she, she and her son-in-law did some research on their family name, her family name, yeah, before she was married to uh, Bill Bradford, who is, uh, uh, oversees the, the work of the church down in Australia right now. Uh, but she found out that seven or eight generations ago in England, her however many greats, grandmother was sentenced to seven years in the penal colony for Sabbath keeping. That would have dated back to the time of the English um, Reformation, the 1600s and approaching close to the 1700s, but mostly the 1600s. So we know that Part of that was that would also identify her as most likely her great 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 grandmother was in God's church, but they were, they were being persecuted in England at the time because the, the uh, Church of England didn't keep the Sabbath, and so off they went. Okay, so this gives us a little, in a sense, uh, of the story or two about the seeking true the true ethics of God. Let's look at the two great commandments as we, as we move through this. These are in Matthew 22. When the Pharisees, uh, verses 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees uh, in an earlier uh, discussion, uh, then they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, see, they weren't trying to become friends with Jesus when he outsmarted the priests, because outsmarted, he just outreasoned the priests, they weren't, they weren't doing the right thing either. They were the Sadducees. Now to give you background, and I do this sometimes, it's important to understand that the Sadducees, it's very unclear whether they really believed in God at all. They believed in the religion, but not necessarily believing in God. And you think, well, how could that be? That's easy. Why were the Israelites punished by being driven out of their homeland? And then later the Jews were punished the same way by God because they drifted from his truth. So it's not surprising that in Christ's time you were in that kind of a situation as well. The priests were highly educated and they really, it was really unclear that any of them believed in God at all. A few did. The Pharisees were the next level of intelligentsia down they ran the synagogues. The priests, their power base was the temple. Oh, they, they still did all of the, the uh, ceremonies around the temple, but without belief, which is unethical in a certain sense that non-believers would be doing that. Now, there were, as I said, there were some who were believed in God, and, and some were called into the church of the Pharisees. A number were called. Paul was a Pharisee, for instance, but they were fire, rather fire-breathing. Although they did some good, they ran the synagogues, they taught on the Sabbath, uh, they, they were the ones who were teaching the people. They were the rank and file leadership where the Sadducees were the higher echelons of society and usually quite wealthy at that time. 
So when the Pharisees heard that he silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Again, we're in Matthew 22 and verse 35 now. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your hand, or all your mind, rather. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So that was revealed in a confrontational conversation Christ had, but it was a masterpiece of fundamental teaching of God's way for us all the way down to now. On these two commandments, love God above all, love your neighbor as yourself, which are summarized by the first four commandments, showing how to love God above all, and the last six of the Ten Commandments showing how to love your neighbor as yourself. This was the keenest summary of God's true ethics, defined and extracted from God's law. So when you read, you're trying to find the statements that really describe the culture and the belief of, of people, or the lack of belief as the case might be in some of these instances, then you're going to want to see what they, what they believe, what they teach, and how they live their lives. And Christ summarized the true culture of the church, of the God's true church. Love God above all things and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, let's look at some of the other, that's the core ethic of the church there in that sense. Let's go to some of the other ethics. They all tie together. Uh, there's not any part of God's law that is, you know, that God has deemed to be applicable uh, at certain times that we can't keep when we live in those times. How about this one? In John chapter 5, where we read before, John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. John 5, verses 16 and 17. These are other godly ethics. As we use the term ethic, that's why I'm repeating it. We read this. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. And what was the reason? Because he had done these things, he had healed some people on the Sabbath. So they wanted to kill him because in their mind they broke the Sabbath. Well, what was he doing? He was healing people on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, and this is how he answered them. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Or if you prefer it in the King James, which uses one of my favorite words of all time. My father works hitherto, and I work. I love hitherto. That's a grand, grand word. We don't get to use it much because nobody knows what it means, but uh, if you think about it, you do. My father works and I work. The true church of God has constantly done God's work of preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God to the world as a witness. At times it didn't do it very strongly, maybe because of persecution, maybe because of lax behavior or conduct of the members at the time. And at other times it had been tremendously powerful. We are not in one of our most tremendously powerful times right now. The church's voice was, was much stronger in the years of Herbert Armstrong, much stronger. And then, as we know, Satan didn't like that, and God let certain trials come upon us, teach us lessons, and the church was broken, and broken apart. Then it didn't have the ability to project the voice of the gospel. And now we have much smaller voices. At least they're trying to say, to, to communicate that, uh, the true gospel of the kingdom of God, but not on the, uh, the power that we were able to do it from the 50s, and I say 50s even though Herbert Armstrong started his preaching in 1933 on Radio KORE out of Springfield, Oregon, next door to Eugene. Been to the building a number of times over the past. Uh, 1953 is when I believe it was Radio Salon. Uh, came online, and there were three radio stations, or three, three main branches of the broadcast, the World Tomorrow broadcast. Of course, in the United States, it was a conglomeration of radio stations across the, the entire country, which 
fell over into Canada, down into Mexico, because one of those stations was eventually in Mexico, um, one, of, one of the outlaw stations, as they called them, uh, that could, we had, could reach on the airwaves, we could reach the entire population of America. Then we got on Radio Luxembourg a little bit later. That was, of course, in Luxembourg, in, uh, in Europe. And that could reach all aspects of Europe and a good share of Africa, a seriously good share of Africa. And then in 1953, I believe it was the year that we got on Radio Salon, which was, again, a clear channel radio station that reached Australia, New Zealand, uh, most of Asia, all of India, uh, obviously, because Salon was next, just off the shore of India. Those were huge and powerful broadcasts. So God has constantly been working. Christ, the Church of God has constantly been doing the work of preaching the kingdom of gospel of the kingdom of God. God's true church has always, even in the times when it didn't have a voice to that magnitude, that, magn that voice was preparation for where we are now and what's coming ahead of us. They didn't always have that magnitude. Going back into the generations, often the church was scattered, small. In one, one particular place, I was thinking about them the other day, they're called the, uh, I think they're called the Lollards. Um, they would walk around repeating the scriptures in a low voice all the time because they each one had a certain part of the Bible it was his duty to memorize. And so they were called mumblers by, uh, I think they were in northern Italy uh, during part of the centuries that, in, the, in the Middle Ages when they were there. Called mumblers because they were always, they were walk and they'd be mumbling as you came, you know, saw them coming by. Well, they were quietly reciting the part of the scripture that it was their duty to remember because they didn't necessarily have copies. But if they could repeat them, then when they met on the Sabbath, then they could have different ones recite portions of scripture or, or remember a portion that applied to a certain, certain circumstance they were facing. There are various ways that God's true church has weathered the storms of history and carried on with the work of God as best they could. We have the heritage of really not that long ago in the past century of a huge, powerful voice of the gospel because of electronic media, primarily radio and then later television. And now the internet is another way. The only problem with internet is it diffuses amongst many other messages that are on the internet. So it's harder, although you can reach people technically, are they being reached because they're busy um, playing, you know, spider solitaire or getting into websites they have no business to be in. And so they aren't going to be listening on the online as much as far as a larger chunk of the population. It does reach beyond to those who God might then go move to listen to what we have to say or read what we have to say. And when I say we, of course, the United Church of God, but there are several other organizations of God's true church that carry the same message. Put us all together, and we're so pretty small fry if we were put all together compared to what even our, you know, our past has seen. But we keep up the message because that's part of the work of God. It will ebb and flow. It has ebb and flowed, ebbed and flowed, but it always stayed alive throughout history from the time of Christ forward. John 5, verse 18 to 19, Therefore the Jews sought that more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also he healed a man on the Sabbath, so that was breaking the Sabbath. Uh, but he said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And in verse 19, Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son does also in like manner. You know, we, we try to carry on where we have the message of God's truth, and we want to carry it forward clearly, like we understood and learned it. But we get a little fuzzy at times. Fuzzy was not in Christ's vocabulary. He precisely knew what the Father thought, and he precisely knew what needed to be said. We strive for that preciseness, but we're purely human, and he was only human for a time. 
But we still have a great work to do and a great work to support and, and a great work of just even our own personal example with others. Now let's look at another point as we go through this challenge, this, this passage of John chapter 5 and verse 20 is the next, next verse in this discussion Christ is having with the Pharisees. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all the things that he himself does. So the Father loves the Son and he shows him what he, the Father, has done. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Greater works. What could be greater than what Christ was doing then? His sacrifice. That would be greater. You know, he was teaching at this time. He was in that phase of his uh, mission on earth, as it were. He was in the teaching phase and, and the preparing the church of God phase by training his, you know, close disciples. Ultimately, he had to die as a sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. And he did. And then he was resurrected. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all the things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works that you may marvel Greater works of the righteous acts of the Father, which we watch in the words of Scripture. God shows his righteous works that we may marvel at his way and his plan and his power and be inspired by the fact that we follow the God of all existence and his son, Jesus Christ. God's way is the greatest way of life. It's also the only way of life. Man's way leads to death. No matter what, what century, whether it was the time when they were meeting at, at, at uh, Bethesda or Bethsaida, that pool of water where Christ healed a man, or whether it's today. It's God's way of life all the time in the mission that he's given us. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 now, if you would, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. The great knowledge of the salvation that God offers through Jesus Christ and our part in it. That's the ethic of God's way. Is God's way is the ethic. That is the standard of behavior that we seek. And when I talk about ethic and, and, the, and the title being the ethic of God's way, that's what we're looking at. What does God the Father do? What does God the Son do? Jesus Christ do? What should the church of God do? How should we conduct ourselves? What is our mission as a people? What is our you know, mission as a person, too, being a, a member of the, of the church? We all have a vital role as a good example of God's way. And you know, we do our best. We fall short. And what do you do when you fall short? That's what knees are for. You go and repent. And you strive to do better with God's blessing and help. And that's how we grow in grace and knowledge. Uh, where did I leave off? I guess it's John 5 and verse 20. I interrupted myself and forgot my spot. God commands, we watchfully obey and rejoice. Verse 20, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all the things he does, and he will show him greater works that you may marvel. I read that a couple times now. The greater works of Christ's sacrifice certainly fall into there. God's way is the greatest way of life, and it's the only way of life. First Peter chapter 1, oh, I think that's where I left off, I apology, but it was good to hear that other one again. Uh, First Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 12, of this salvation, this salvation that Christ made possible through his sacrifice, which was also made possible through the sacrifice of the Father, allowing the Son to become the sacrifice, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. First Peter 1, verses 10 to 12. They have inquired, the prophets in the Old Testament inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied the grace that would come. Now this, this grace here really has a, a direct application to the forgiveness of sin, which was not available in the way that it is available under Christ, it wasn't available back when it was, what was being sacrificed wasn't the Lamb of God, it was the lambs of the Israelites. They were only uh, representative of what the sacrifice of Christ would be. And we go on reading here, 
prophesied of the grace that would come to you, and in verse 11, searching what or in what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which, uh, which or who was, which says who in the King James, or in the King James, the New King James, it, the Spirit of Christ isn't it, it isn't a person. Uh, it's the translation in a personal pronoun is a uh, fallout from the doctrine of the Trinity, which thinks the, un the Holy Spirit is a third person of the Godhead, which is wrong, completely wrong. The Spirit of Christ which was in them and indicating when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed not to themselves, but to us. That is, they, we the prophets, not to themselves, but they were ministering to the things which now are reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. The knowledge that we have, that we can converse on after services and before, the knowledge that we learn from our textbook, which is God's word, which we read every day a little bit, sometimes, some days a lot. That knowledge is what angels desire to look into. They've been in on this, this process for a long time, you know, ever since they were created. They were watching it happen and, and knowing about it. A third of them didn't like it and they rebelled and they're gone. The holy angels are enthralled by it. They know the incredible human potential that God offers to us humans. They've had it explained. They can see the picture. The salvation of Christ's soon coming king is so incredible that the angels are fascinated by the process of the preaching and the calling and the conversions and finally the resurrection to eternal life. Our, our spiritual birth, as it were, to entering the realm of eternity in the kingdom of God. Now, the demonic spirits, the fallen angels, are not so happy with it. And although that's not the topic of the sermon, I can mention it. That's why Satan is against the church and against, well, against life and against in mankind generally. You know, well, why is he angry at mankind? They don't know God's truth, but they will. They will. Their day will come. Whether it's in the time that we're doing the work of God today or in the millennium, if they live through the Great Tribulation and help to repopulate the earth, they'll hear the truth expressed then. And if they die before that happens so that they have to be resurrected in the great white throne judgment, then they will know then. When God has done, every last human being that ever lived upon the earth will have known the truth with a clear enough understanding to make their final decision as to whether they would follow and live that way or not. We have chosen to live by it as we had it revealed to us. We were called out of this world to understand these things. Going to John chapter 5 and verse 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. He who believes my word, the teachings of Jesus, <clears throat> Which we, in, you know, the church's job is to expound that always. Uh, of course, other churches think that's their job too. And granted, to the degree that they expound it clearly, it's, it's good. You know, even some general knowledge has a benefit. But the incisive knowledge that God's church has now is remarkable. And that is what constitutes a witness to those who hear it. And who God then opens the minds to be called in this age and join the effort that we're a part of, or be a part of the effort that we're a part of, in that sense. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Now, that final passing from death to life, when we actually inherit eternal life, comes at the resurrection of the dead, which occurs when Christ returns. Eternal life awaits those who seek it, truly, and God then calls them. Repentance, overcoming, and enduring to the end must follow that calling. And we've understood this, and this is the challenge for us. We've understood this, everybody in this room, for years, some for decades and decades, many decades even, in this long-lived congregation. 
but we have to endure to the end of our lives or the end of the age, whichever comes first. Being faithful to God. Living by the standard and the knowledge that he's revealed to us. We go to John chapter 5, verse 25 now, to 27. Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear hear will live. Now, you think, well, what do you mean it now is when they would hear the voice and that they would live like in eternal life or even physical life? When Christ died, God resurrected many people. Back to physical life, not to a spiritual resurrection. They just were brought back to life and walked out of the graves in many cases. And how do you walk out of a grave? You got all that dirt on top of you. Well, they didn't bury people like that. They carved holes in the rocks, crypts, or uh, I don't know what you call them uh, in other languages. But they were, buried, they were buried by being laid out on a stone in a cave, and then the cave was sealed. Different kind of burial than what we have. But it wouldn't make any difference. God can rematerialize somebody uh, if they're down in a deep grave. It doesn't make any difference. When he resurrects, those who he calls will come back to life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live, for as the Father has life in himself, so he is granted to the Son to have life in himself. Life in himself, meaning self-existing eternal power and life. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is a son of man. Judgment can be yea or it can be nay. We seek the judgment of yea. The judgment of our Savior executes his resurrection to eternal life or resurrection to die in the second death for those who commit the unpardonable sin. We need to keep clearly in mind that we seek the resurrection to eternal life, not the other one. In God's soon coming kingdom. In verse 28 of John 5, Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Don't marvel at this. this, this is what, it's going to be routine. This is the way things are going to happen. There will be a time, the hour is coming, when all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Impossible to human beings who don't understand God's plan but completely possible for those who do understand God's plan and word. And those who have done evil to the resurrection, well, let me just skip, uh, skip one here, and they will come forth in verse 29, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. That is what we seek. That is our goal. We don't want to be a part of the next one. And those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation which translates in as far as the historical events and God's plan laid out in the book of Revelation and elsewhere, uh, being dying the second death in the lake of fire, from which there is no resurrection. There's no immortal soul that goes on to live, even if it lived in a bad place. There's just no, it, God is merciful, but there is no future in not following God's way. Verse 30. I can of myself do nothing. And why would Christ say that? Well, because he was human at the time. He was God too, but he was human and and had the human limitations. I of myself can do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will. How much at the time do we find ourselves seeking our own will in things and not seeking the will of God the Father? who sent us, or who sent Christ. I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. See, our wills, in the sense of what we purpose to do, when we come to conversion, our wills are changed from the hodgepodge of things that we were purposing our lives to do before to the primary thing of following Jesus Christ and living, being a living, active part of God's true church. And the work that had to be done of publishing the gospel of the kingdom of God before the end of the age. The two resurrections of God's judgment. The first is a resurrection of life, eternal life in God's kingdom. That's the first resurrection. Then there is a second resurrection of judgment. There's also a third resurrection, but it isn't a resurrection of judgment like uh, these two are. The second resurrection of judgment 
is to live a physical life and choose life in God's kingdom. And that resurrection of judgment will come during the millennium. The great white throne judgment, actually. Millennium is an extension of population living through from now. But there will be a time when God reaches back in history, and God has a long arm, a long arm of the law, long arm of God. He'll reach back to the back into history to those who existed, lived a human lifetime. Maybe they were pretty good people. Maybe they were pretty dishonest people. Maybe they were just bloodthirsty, evil rascals. And he will bring them back to life because they never knew the truth. They hadn't had their eyes open like ours are open and our ears are open. They didn't know God's way. They didn't know what they needed to decide in a fullness. And God knows when they have that full knowledge. They will come up to a second lifetime called the Great White Throne Judgment. And they will then live that lifetime making the choice to follow God or not. It is a decision they need to make. And guess what? We need to make the same decision now. They were called ahead of time. The great white throne judgment is not an option for us. Verse 20 of chapter, or Revelation 20, verses 11 and 12. Then I saw the great white throne judge, that he, in him who sat on it, from whose face the heaven and earth passed away, and there was found no more place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. Well, that is the great white throne judgment. For those who never knew the truth, all the way back to Adam, all the way forward to the, the last baby born in this age, perhaps, they will have their opportunity. You know, traditional Christianity doesn't offer that. The immortal souls of all those who never accepted Christ are being eternally fried in the deep fat fryer of hell or whatever kind of elaboration they like to put to it. But there is no immortal soul. We are immortal souls. God gives us life. He can take the life away. The great white throne judgment is when everybody is offered life like the church is being offered life now and has it in the, the small number of the church all the way back into history. And thus he saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and the books were opened and they were being judged by those books. Then there's the third resurrection. This is in Revelation 20 verses 13 to 15. Revelation 20 verses 13 to 15. This is the resurrection that leads to the lake of fire no eternal life this is how God deals with those who just choose no choose, choose to disobey and choose the way of sin in verse 13 of Revelation 20 the sea gave up the dead who were in it and the dead and death and Hades uh, death in the grave uh, delivered up the dead who were in them some people died and didn't get into the grave other people died and they got buried the death in Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Those who choose not end up in the lake of fire, and that's the end of them. Those who choose life, when God calls them, whether it's in this age or maybe the Old Testament age, there were very few then, but a few, there were a few, the prophets, King David, certain ones. There are relatively many more in the church age, from the time of Christ forward to the return of Christ, many more. But by comparison to the total world population, a very tiny fraction of that. And we have our chance and our opportunity to choose life and live ethically by God's ethic, which is his law and his way. This is our time of judgment. This is our time of deciding. Kind of scary. It's very exciting, except frankly, and in many ways it's exhilarating to begin to know the truth. A lot of people over the years, uh, when you hear the, read the reports back on the old Plain Truth magazines, uh, or in some conversations, you find out how excited they were to find out God's truth. And you think back, oh, we were too. It was my grandmother that first came into the church, knowledge of the truth. And my father then learned it from her. That was his mother-in-law. Uh, and then, you know, the, my mother did begin to follow it as well. And then my brothers and sisters and I. Many families had similar experiences to that, very similar. 
So the sea gave up the dead who were in it in Revelation 20 and verse uh, 13 to 15. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each according to their works. And, and then anyone not found written in the book of life after all those three judgments, the judgment of this age, the judgment of the millennium, the judgment of the great white throne judgment, uh, whoever did not follow God was thrown into the lake of fire after they had had their opportunity. And all people have their opportunity there. From every person, from Adam on, will be offered the choice of eternal life or not. We seek the resurrection of life in the eternal kingdom of God. These are the important things we conclude this. We seek the resurrection of life in the eternal kingdom of God because it will be eternal life we are inheriting when we are resurrected when Christ returns. We therefore, brethren, by personal choice and with every, and every effort, seek to embrace and follow the ethic of God's word and kingdom. The ethic being the standard of behavior and, and obedience. Our ethic is our code of behavior that comes from God. So it's God's, God's ethic in that sense. Our desire and our spiritual longing is to be resurrected into the glorious kingdom of God. It's important that we re repeat that and think that through on a regular basis. The world is too much with us, late and soon, as one poet said, and it deflects our attention away from the true ways of God. But let's keep them focused on the Father and on our Savior.